Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss the start to the election campaign as Sunak fires off gaffes that would make Boris Johnson blush, Labour mess up on the social media campaign again, and Jeremy Corbyn finally does something useful for the party he's abused for so many years. In actual fact, I can have a pop at a, a few things that happen, but I'm going to sort of focus it on here. Like Rishi Sunak, he announced the election in the most chaotic way imaginable, by the way, and then followed it up with acts of breathtaking incompetence yesterday. It conjured up the old Simpson scene. You know, you just imagine as Rishi Sunak heads out for his campaigning that day, the staff at Downey Street whispering to each other, get ready, he's about to do something stupid. And there were three main bits of uh, negative news about Sunak yesterday, I suppose, though only two of them were acts of stupidity. The other was a simple reckoning with reality. The reckoning with reality was that various things are now not going to happen that he promised would happen before summer. Um, the biggest of which is there will be no flights to Rwanda after us. That is because, according to Sunak's own timetable, flights could not have begun before mid-June at the very earliest, and that's assuming they cleared all the legal hur hurdles, which is a huge if. We do not know. The, I mean, the, the, the last word from the Supreme Court was that the Rwanda plan is unlawful. This legislation, the latest legislation was supposed to deal with that. We don't know that it did. But with Parliament set to dissolve next week, PERDA would then begin, which is a period when you're not... <laughs> the civil service can't do anything that would be uh, politically controversial or could affect the election in any way. Which means, amongst other things, they, you know, the the idea of proceeding with actions that are legally dubious, completely out of the question. So there will now be a political battle over the Rwanda plan narrative. Sunak will attempt to say the Rwanda plan's all set up, it's there, it's done, uh, the results will be instantaneous. That's what he's saying. As soon as the flights go off, the boats will stop coming within a matter of weeks. But it'll only happen if the Conservatives win the election, because it can't now happen during the election campaign. So the Tories are attempting to use this as a reason to vote Conservative rather than Reform UK. Opponents of the scheme will point out that Sunak has deliberately called the election such that his Rwanda plan will never be put to the test. Because if it were, it would fail. This will inevitably include Reform UK themselves. When Sunak's Rwanda safety bill passed into law, Nigel Farage said, bold as brass, no flights will ever take off. Well, he now gets to claim he was right. However, there the strategy ended. Sunak had a couple of embarrassing moments yesterday. In no particular order, he attended a clearly stage-managed, you know, supposed public engagement to take questions from voters. However, Adam Vienkov of Byline Times was able to identify that at least two of the people asking questions of Sunak were actually Conservative councillors who'd been planted in the audience. This is like in 2019 when Lee Anderson got one of his friends to pretend to be an ordinary voter so he could film himself trying to persuade him to vote for him. Now, a then unknown Conservative candidate pulls that sort of deception. That's embarrassing. But the Prime Minister and leader of the Conservatives doing the same, that should be a real own goal. Because not only is it being reported anyway, but wouldn't it be a shame if someone were to mention this in the leadership debates, which will now be coming? If ever the issue of honesty comes up, people can say, well, you duped the public on day one of the campaign. And consider what this means about Sunak's approach to the election as well. I could say it shows how deeply dishonest he is. But political campaigns tend to include some theatre, don't they? But this is an outright deception, should be called out. But more importantly, it shows just how afraid Sunak is of the public. You know, it's like Theresa May in 2017. He's going to attempt to give the impression of public engagement, but without the public having very much to do with it. He's saying he wants a debate, a TV debate with Starmer, every week of the campaign. But what would this do? It would give Sunak an excuse to not go out in public anywhere near as much. And as importantly, it would restrict the number of places that Starmer can personally visit around the country. No, mate. Starmer's agreed to do the main debates and will spend the rest of the campaign visiting as much of the country as possible. If Sunak cannot make the points he wants to make in two or three debates, why would he do any better in four or five? Sunak's looking for excuses to engage only in carefully staged managed campaign events. And with good reason. 
His second gaff, arguably not as serious, but it is a good example of how out of touch he is. If the first one was a case of how afraid he is of the public, this one was just the reason for being afraid. He doesn't know how to engage with people. So he visited Wales, he was at a brewery, and he asked people there if they were looking forward to all the football this summer. Well, I mean, I suppose there's two international football tournaments. There's the Olympics, but in Britain we don't take part in that because we have all these home nation, um, individual home nation associations that can't sort of sort themselves out. So the big one is the Euros. Wales have failed to qualify for the Euros. Now, sure, real football fans will watch the sport regardless of the team. It's, it's nice. It's an extra bit of spice when your own team is involved, right? But this is what you would say if you wanted to rub people's noses in it, that there's going to be this huge international competition, which your team's part of, because Rishi Sunak's English, your team's part of, and the other's not. It's like, you know, in any other context, if an Englishman goes to Wales, you go, oh, you're looking forward to the Euros, you would think they're taking the piss. So, of course, that's how it's going to be taken when the Prime Minister says that. You know, and although I've said that Sunak's advisors are as out of touch as he is, this is the sort of thing that would be really hard to stop, even if the advisors had their own heads screwed on, which they don't. You know, the leader has to engage with the public. That's got to include some off-the-cuff remarks. They can't stage manage everything. Or they'll end up with Theresa May's problem, which is you never talk to the public. The Tories have got to close the poll gap a bit at least, so they've got to go out. They can't hide away. People would say the Sunak's going to hide away like Boris Johnson did. He can't afford to. Boris Johnson was ahead in the polls. He was playing a defensive game. He could afford to park the bus. Rishi Sunak can't. He's got to go on the offence. So he has to ad lib to an extent. But his view of the world is just missing so many fundamental components that we can expect more blunders like this. In 2019, the strategy team could tell Priti Patel and Jacob Rees-Mogg, keep a low profile. Because their views, they might be safe enough in their own constituencies. Just go around your own constituencies. Don't say anything to the national press. But you can't tell your own leader to keep quiet and hide under a rock for the next six weeks. Mind you, as I said at the start, you know, I don't think it was all smooth uh, sailing for, for Labour either. I don't think they managed yesterday particularly well. There were no great gaffes like this, by the way, in terms of the way it's been reported in the press. It's all fine. But there was, you know, there was a bit of a launch event yesterday. And they were supposed to stream it live on their YouTube channel. Supposed to a proper dog's breakfast was made of it. The stream was from 9am. You go on 9am, it's streaming. There's a card there going, oh, uh, you know, 9am from 9am, this launch event. So you're watching it, you're watching it. There's nothing happening. It's just this card. All it broadcast was that card. For You know, it's an hour long stream. And you, you had to wait till into the 34th minute before anything happened. Then it lasts for a few minutes. Then you've got another roughly half an hour of basically nothing. So if you tried to watch it live, as I did, you'd be there going, you eventually get bored and go away. Or if you try and watch it afterwards, you'll get bored and go away because you'll be watching this thing. It'll be like 34, you'll get to like 33 minutes. Oh, I've had enough of this. If you wait another half a minute, you'd have seen something. Endlessly baffling to me that the Labour Party is such a slick operation in so many ways now. Not infallible, makes some mistakes and it makes mistakes across the board. But, it, you know, it's, it's on such a professional footing now. Yet their understanding of social media is, is in the Stone Age. It's absolutely in the basement. But I long ago give up any notion of Labour using social media effectively in this campaign. Could have been better, could have been so much better. You know, for a party that really struggles to get a fair hearing in the mainstream media, to have direct access to the public, direct they can control that message that narrative they can talk about whatever they want and they don't use it and it's because they don't understand the first thing about it and the problem is of course it's not just that they don't understand they don't realize that they don't understand because they don't listen to people who do and you may think well you know okay Phil, a bit of a missed opportunity but that's fairly small fry isn't it i think it's huge i think it's missing out on an enormous potential and I think it's a shocking area of incompetence for Labour. And you could say, yes, they're going to win this election. And they could have won it by a bigger margin. But they're going to win it. But there's going to come a time in the future where they're going to struggle. And having a large presence on social media, which takes time to build up, could be a huge boon for them. 
And the worst part is I don't think they'll ever realize this because the problem is winning allows you to think you know what you're doing. It's the nature of politics in particular. You do get it in some other areas of life, but I think in politics in particular, like when politicians win, they think they're the bee's knees and no need for improvement. We did everything right. We won, you see, because it's so binary for them. But when they lose, like they got everything wrong. And it's like, no, you didn't get everything wrong. That bit was fine. Keep that. But oh, no, it was all wrong. Throw it all in the bin. Start again. Politics just doesn't have nuance. Finally, the other big but completely unsurprising news, though technically from today rather than the first campaign day, Jeremy Corbyn standing as an independent. I said he would, didn't I? Because he's never been Labour. He's the left-wing equivalent of the UKIP entryist into the Tory party, right? He's only ever used the party to further his own ends. I'm quite pleased he's announced his intention to stand so early as well. Characteristic of the arse he made of Labour's campaign in 2019, that he would shoot his mouth off so early this time. Had he waited until the deadline day, because he's already got the support he's going to get, he doesn't need a long campaign. Had he waited until deadline day, he could have at least helped his fellow entryists out. Not now. I'm going to be guessing people are going to be putting pressure on Momentum and SCG members to say what they think. Momentum will have to say, if they want to stay in Labour, that they support the Labour candidate. So will the members of the SCG. If they show any support for Corbyn at all, then they are basically campaigning against Labour. Clear breach of Labour Party rules, off they go. So the Bailey Bot and Co will have to support the Labour candidate, at least until deadline day. You could argue that, because if they, if you, ahead of deadline day, Labour can just say, right, you're not our candidate. They can just get someone in quickly. There'll be someone who wants to do it. And then their seat on the gravy train ends. Now, if any of them supported Corbyn, say, after the deadline day, like, let's say they did a Kate Hoey, uh, from 2019 and they supported him after the deadline date. So, okay, Labour could pull their support, but they, they can't get another candidate in. Okay. So those people would probably then get to remain an MP at least, but then that will be their last parliament before the gravy train ticket runs out. Now, for a couple of them, they think, well, one more parliament, I'm okay with that. But there's other ones who want to be in parliament for a lot longer. Yeah, they're basically unemployable, some of them. Um, and they'll never get to see what life is like on the other side of the House of Commons chamber. So, you know, characteristically selfish of Corbyn here because he's dropping his mates right in it. As for how the result will go in Islington North, now I've got no personal um, direct information or data to go off. I, You know, you could tell me that Labour will win anyway and I'll go, yeah. And you could tell me that Corbyn will win anyway. I'll go, yeah, OK. I am informed by people in the area they believe Corbyn, yes, he's personally popular and people were happy enough with him as an MP but that people will vote Labour, that they will vote for the party. Now, like I say, I've got no objective data to go off. And in a way, even if Corbyn won, still be worth it for me. It's nice when the poison in your veins leaves of its own accord and Labour have more than enough seats. It doesn't affect anything. Uh, it's entirely beneficial for Labour. If he stands and loses, all the better, but it's win-win for Labour. So we've certainly had an interesting start to the electoral campaign. Uh, still more aspects of the launch I haven't even touched on yet. Fun times, fun times. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe for further content and click the like button. You can also sign up for memberships if you'd like to support the channel further. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'll see you later.